Hey guys! Today we're going to be doing a reading vlog about Priory of the Orange Tree. So, it is Friday. I have the day off because I scheduled a hair appointment for the middle of the day on a Friday, which is a work day for me typically, for some reason. <laughs> So I had to take the day off and I'm gonna be getting my hair cut shortly. Really excited about that, but also really excited to tell you about Priory of the Orange Tree. I am about 200 pages into this, so I'm still firmly in part one, but so far it's really good. The first 50 pages were definitely kind of intimidating, <laughs> trying to get a grasp on like the politics, the characters, even the countries and stuff and sort of why they're fighting. So it's been really interesting so far. Once I got over that kind of like 50 page hurdle of getting my bearings, I've been really enjoying the story. It's definitely like lots of political intrigue, there's spying, and there's obviously dragons, which we love here. <laughs> I think the portrayal of dragons is just so cool in this book because you have, you're dealing with like a lot of different types of dragons so far. In the east we have kind of like these dragons that really resemble Chinese dragons and how they're sort of spirits of water. In the West, we're dealing with sort of the more European, fire-breathing, really destructive, scary dragons. And some of these guys even talk, like this one right here, I think his name is Firadel? Firadel? There's a really intense scene where he's like calling out for this queen that's his enemy to appear and surrender, basically, and that was so scary and intense oh my gosh and like he's huge and just so terrifying and you really feel like the fear that these people have for these dragons and this is a source of contention between the east and the west the west believe that the eastern people are like worm worshippers and they're really failing to recognize that the types of dragons that they're dealing with are so different. So it's been really cool sort of delving into this world. Again, I'm only 200 pages into it, which is this first bookmark right here. The second bookmark is um, where part one ends. So I've been kind of keeping that in as a milestone for myself. But yeah, yes, you can see I'm like, I'm barely even scratched the surface of this book and I'm already really liking it so far. So I'm gonna take you guys along with me um, and hopefully I can finish this book in this vlog and I can tell you my thoughts on it. So yeah, come on and follow along. because of the ashy uh, gloshies, but I'm loving it. I, I love the cooler blonde and I love the haircut. It's nice and sassy and summery. Feel maybe a little bit like Hal from Hal's Moving Castle, but that's a look. I love it. for my hair appointment, but it's really nice outside still, so I think I'm gonna grab some water, throw on some sunscreen, and go grab my book and read in the park by the water. So it's a little late, but I think I can get an hour or two of reading in in the sun.
So we moved Rocket's cat bed uh, when we were vacuuming recently, and let me just show you. Put it on the table to get it out of the way, and he loves it here. <laughs> so now we just have a cat bed on the coffee table. Because we're pushover parents. And Rocket gets what Rocket wants. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Also, I want to read all day, like, my boyfriend's at work, because it's a Saturday, but he had to cover somebody else's shift. So I'm all by myself, which is like the perfect opportunity to read. But I'm working on like two other videos at the moment, and I have to watch um, Howl's Moving Castle for one, which I love Howl's Moving Castle, so like, it's a chore, but not really. <laughs> and I just read the book last week, and it was so good. It was like the nostalgia alone was amazing. And so I am looking forward to watching the movie. I just feel like I have so much to do this weekend <laughs> to make sure my videos are up for next week. And yeah, so I'm gonna watch Howl's Moving Castle, take some notes, hopefully film the Howl's Moving Castle video I'm gonna do, and then I can get to reading Priory of the Orange Tree again today. <laughs> Just finished filming my Howl's Moving Castle video. Gotta go edit that now. Hopefully that won't take me too long. I would, I want to incorporate clips from the movie, but I don't know if that's gonna be like really complicated or take a really long time. So we'll see. <laughs> but hopefully after that I can get to reading. It's been a really busy day and I just wanna chill out now. So. <sighs> since I last updated. I've been really busy, but I did some reading at work on my lunch break today and I'm almost 400 pages into Priory of the Orange Tree. Side note, props to Bookbo. I did not think even their largest book sleeve would fit Priory, but it does quite comfortably. Um, so yeah, I'm almost at part three and a lot is happening. I'm gonna drive home now and give you guys kind of a brief update of uh, where I'm at and then probably spend the rest of my evening reading because I want to try to have this blog up for Friday and it is Wednesday. <laughs> so I'm a little behind, but I'm loving the book so far. It's really awesome. Hi guys. Okay, so I'm back home from work and I have a lot of updates uh, about this book. I am now about halfway through, just about. These other tabs are where the other parts start for the book. So I've kind of left those as goal posts. So let me tell you a little bit more about what this is about because I don't think I've updated you since the start of this vlog about what the heck is going on. So as I said before, this is a multi POV fantasy and we follow four different characters sort of throughout the scope of the world. And as I said before, there's a really stark divide between the Eastern and Western cultures, especially how they view their dragons. So we follow a couple characters in the East and a couple characters in the West. The scope kind of reminds me of a, a Song of Ice and Fire, the Game of Thrones series, but with way fewer POV characters. Again, there's only four. In the West, we have Eid, who is like a handmaiden to the queen of the kingdom Innis, and She's actually a spy. <laughs> spy is kind of a negative connotation, but she works for the titular Priory of the Orange Tree. She is a maiden of their society. It's like a secret order of mages. So she was placed within the court of this queen in order to protect her. This queen, Sabran, comes from a line of queens who supposedly, as long as they exist, keeps the fearsome nameless one at bay and he is basically like the big bad dragon who is going to destroy humankind if he ever wakes up. As long as Sabran's family line is intact, humanity is safe supposedly 
and there's like a whole religion surrounding this, the order of the six virtues or something. It takes a lot from like sort of the, the code, knight's code of chivalry that we're sort of more familiar with from medieval Europe, but it's made into a religion and basically her ancestor from way, way back sanctified himself as like the, the top of this religion basically and has said that his, his family line will protect people from the dragons, so... Yeah, so Eid is in court to protect Sabran, who may or may not be the descendant of her own sort of saint, the mother, and she uses her mage powers to protect her in secret, because no one can know she's a mage, and it starts off with her sort of protecting the queen from cutthroats, but it sort of evolves into like dragons are waking up and <laughs> Eid has to protect her from sort of draconian threats. So that is really interesting. It also has a bit of a guard trope in that she's not outright a guard, like Sabran doesn't know that Eid is protecting her, but they're catching feelings for one another. <laughs> and the other Western-ish perspective we're following is this man named Loth, short for Ardaloth, and he was actually a close friend of Sabran, but he was sent away from court because other people in court thought he was too close to Sabran and like threatened her ability to basically be married to a royal from another kingdom. And he is nobility, but he's not royalty, and where Innis is really scared about like the threat of dragons coming back because they're starting to wake up again at the beginning of this. They really want to strengthen their ties with other kingdoms. So Loth is sent away because he's seen as a threat from the court and he's not happy about this obviously and friend who's also of nobility Kit comes along and they're actually sent down south where one kingdom that previously was part of Virtudom, which is what they call like all the kingdoms that believe in this religion that Innis was founded in. One kingdom from the south actually has turned away from Virtudom and they worship the Nameless One, this big bad dragon. So they've been sort of ostracized from the rest of Virtudom, but part of Loth's mission is to figure out why this happened and also to find the queen's father, because he was sent there as an ambassador before they turned into a draconian worship worshiping society, but he hasn't been heard from in quite a few years. So Loth is on a mission to do that, and again, he's not happy about being sent away from court, but he figures while he's there, he's going to serve his duty as best as he can to the queen and his friend Sabran. In the east, we're following this character named Tane, and she has worked her whole life to become a dragon rider, but in her first chapter, she witnesses something that might endanger her ability to do that, and she sort of has to do something that goes against everything she's ever known. And so I thought that was a really interesting way to introduce us to this character who has a very hard set like belief system that she must immediately betray like as you get to know her. So that's been really interesting and she's been a really cool character. And finally, we have another character in the West. His name is Nicolas Roos, but he's actually an alchemist from the East who was banished from Sabran's court before the beginning of the novel. And as an alchemist, he had offered Sabran the chance to sort of fund his quest for an elixir of everlasting life, but Nicolas has quite a few vices that sort of get in the way of him doing this, and he ends up sort of spending the money that's set for his research on wine. <laughs> and ends up getting banished because Sabran's really mad at him. And again, as I've said, there's a really stark divide culturally between the East and the West, and the people of the East don't even want Westerners setting foot on their land because of the fear of this draconian plague that the Western, the Westerners have suffered in the past. So they're like completely isolated from the West, with the exception of this one trading post, which is where Nicolas has found himself for the past several years in his, in his banishment, in his exile. He ends up getting wrapped up in Tane's story a little bit, which ends up with him being able to escape this trading post that he's been stuck in for several years. And he's kind of like the wild card character so far. I'm not quite sure where his loyalties lie. He does not like Sabran, obviously, for banishing him, but he wants to make his way back to the West because that's where his family ties are and all of his, you know, good memories are as well. So yeah, those are the four characters. 
my arm hurts from holding up that book so long. Oh my god. <laughs> but yeah, so those are the four perspectives we're following and I think this is really unique in that I am actually invested in all four point of views and for fantasy that can be really hit or miss even in a Game of Thrones. Some character like POV chapters are infamously very slow. <laughs> Ran. But I've been really interested in where all of these stories are going. Obviously sometimes things happen where there's like a really twisty or like really big thing that happens at the end of a chapter and it like smash cuts to a totally different person and you're like, wait, no, I want to know more about them. But I do find myself still being invested in that other person's story once I get over the shock of whatever it was that just happened. But yeah, as I've said, really enjoying this so far. It's honestly kind of hard to like talk about and summarize in a coherent way because obviously like this is a really dense book, so much is happening, and I don't want to spoil anything, but like I also can't give vague updates the further I get into it because like it literally would not make sense unless I spoiled some stuff. I'm hoping I can kind of slam out some more soon tonight. Uh, the last week has been weirdly busy, and like I'm not a very busy person, <laughs> so usually I have a lot of time for reading, but this last couple of days, man. So I'm a little behind, so I'm gonna try to smash out as much as possible tonight and hopefully kind of get back on track so I can get this vlog up on time. Okay, I painted my nails first because some of them were chipped and it was bothering me. So did that, gonna make dinner, and then I'm gonna read. everyone. Um, it has now been over two weeks since I started this vlog and a couple of days since I finished Priory of the Orange Tree, so I figure it's about time to wrap this baby up. I don't know what really confident part of me thought I was gonna be able to finish this book and vlog in like the time span of a week. Pure hubris. Obviously this book is really hefty and it's not exactly fast paced either, which is not a problem for me. It just if you do plan on reading this, I wouldn't expect to be able to fly through it in a couple of days, but maybe that's different for somebody else. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, so my overall impression of the book was that it was really fantastic. I loved this book a lot. I gave it five stars on Goodreads. I believe I've mentioned before that sort of the scope and subject matter reminds me a little bit of A Song of Ice and Fire, the Game of Thrones series. So if you're into that but would prefer a story perhaps that is just one book and has an ending, I would recommend this. <laughs> the dragons as well as like the political aspect of this book and sort of the cultural divide b between the East and the West especially is what reminds me a lot of Game of Thrones. So if you enjoyed those things about either the books or the TV show, I think you would probably really enjoy this. I've already gone into sort of the characters that we follow in this story. There are four main points of view, but I will say I think Eid's storyline feels like the main one and the other three sort of just support that one and like move the plot along and stuff, but I don't think that makes the other characters bad. I do wish Tane had a little bit more development because she was so cool and she was the one besides Eid who I was like most intrigued by 
and I do really like the way that all of their plot lines intersected towards the end and I don't think anybody felt sort of like left out of the conclusion or like the final sort of action of this book. It, they all had a part to play. Just Eid's storyline feels like the central one and there's nothing wrong with that. I like I personally don't think this would have worked in just Eid's perspective so all the other points of view had their parts to play but I did really enjoy all the characters both the point of view characters as well as some of the other ones whose heads we never get in but we see a lot of such as Queen Sabran. I thought her character was really interesting and had a lot of depth to it. This book also has a really strong sort of sense of duality in a variety of things. Again you have this eastern versus western cultural divide, you have the eastern dragons versus the western worms, you have you know fire and water, sort of the earth and like cosmos, and it was really interesting to see Samantha Shannon really tackle all of these. She was able to fit a lot I think into 830 pages and I mean that's a hefty book but considering this is a standalone and she was able to sort of like touch on all these themes within just one book is really impressive and I liked what she did with it. Again even though it is just one book this world feels really developed. I got a really good sense of the peoples, the politics, the magic system. I do wish she had gone a little bit more into that because you have these sort of, I don't want to go into spoilers too much, but you have these like trees such as the orange tree that have these magical properties but you don't really know why or like the origin of that so like I thought that was such a really intriguing idea but I wish it had gone into it a little bit more into like why they existed in the first place because I thought that was really cool. Something that has been said about this novel a lot is that it's very diverse. You have a couple of LGBTQ characters. The courts, especially in the West, are very obviously inspired by medieval, like medieval Europe courts, but you have a lot of sort of, again, casual diversity. There's a lot of brown people at court. One of our um, main Inish courtiers is described as black and like that's never an issue like it's very not a big deal. Same thing with same-sex couples. The only thing that makes anybody's love forbidden is sort of their social status but that has nothing to do with the color of their skin. So I thought that was really refreshing because it was obvious Samantha Shannon again was really inspired by real life cultures and political systems but she was not like beholden to that like to the T. Just because it was inspired by medieval Europe doesn't mean that like all the characters had to be white and straight so I really appreciated that and I do hope to see more of that from fantasy going forward. I do feel like that is sort of working its way into fantasy narratives now and while romance isn't like the central point of this novel by any means. I think there was a really well done slow burn sapphic romance and it was handled really well and I think realistically you have a bit of a, like a guard trope thing happening and I like that. And once again I will say that this is a pretty slow burn book. Um, the first 50 to 75 pages are really about establishing the world and getting all the characters sort of straight. I was intrigued from the very first page but I was also like a little confused the first 50 pages. <laughs> but that's again any epic fantasy is gonna be like that. It's just been a while since I I've read an adult epic fantasy of this scope that I didn't already have sort of prior knowledge to rely on going into it. Definitely give yourself some time to sort of marinate in the world and all the world building and details. I think they're really beautifully done and it was such an interesting world to sort of explore for like 800 pages. I really enjoyed this every time I picked it up and I had a really good sense by the end of the book what this world was and how it was going to be moving Moving forward. I wouldn't expect to get through this book again really quickly. It took me about two weeks to read and I'm a pretty, I don't know if I'm a fast reader, but I have a lot of time to read and it took me a lot longer than I expected it to. But again, I think that was just hubris on my part because this is not a small book by any means and it was intimidating. I don't know why I was like, I can get this done in a week, but mm. But yeah, so thank you guys so much for watching this vlog. Sorry I like wasn't updating quite as much towards the end. It got to a point where like if I wasn't spending my free time reading or like just solely focused on reading, I felt like I was never gonna finish the book. And again, that's not a negative towards this book by any means. I think it just demands a lot of your time and attention and there's nothing wrong with that. And that's part of what makes the world so intriguing and what kept me wanting to read is like a it felt very fully realized. So yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. Feel free to like, subscribe, follow my socials down in the description box below, and have a great day. Bye!